Iowa basketball goes on the road and gets their signature victory of the season as they knock off Rutgers 76 to 65. We break things down and the coming out party of Peyton Sanford. Transfer Kirk, he's hit it again, the portal. Coming up big for the Iowa Hawkeye football team. We'll talk about the latest development there and some help for the offensive line. We talk about some of the other visits that are happening over the weekend and the future of Iowa football as we look forward. A huge weekend for the Iowa men getting the win at Rutgers. The women do the same. They go on the road. They beat the Michigan Wolverines, a top 15 road victory for them. And the wrestling team also picks up a couple of victories. It's a busy weekend. We cap it all on Locked On Hawkeyes. Our Locked On Hawkeyes, your daily podcast on the Iowa Hawkeyes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in. I'm Trent Condon, and this is the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Thanks for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen each and every day. Available wherever you get podcasts. You can also find us on YouTube. While you're there, hit that subscribe button and help us get in front of more Hawkeye fans. Just takes a second and definitely helps us out. Well, a big help for this Iowa basketball team as they try to dig out of the hole of December and early January as they get their second consecutive victory in Big Ten play. This time, a road win as they go to Rutgers, one of the most difficult places to win in the Big Ten and get the victory. How about this, Iowa, with the win? They're the first team in five years to win at Rutgers and never trail in the basketball game. He and Rutgers just their second loss inside the rack today. Now it's called Jersey Mike's, but it'll always be the rack, the Rutgers athletic uh, complex. It, it is an incredibly difficult place to win. They're right on top of you. It's a smaller gym and they pack the place now. You know, as Rutgers basketball has become more and more relevant, that is something that we've seen just how tough that place is, and they play well in their building. Iowa came out right away, started shooting lights out. In the end, it was the shooting that also got it done. Let's break things down. In fact, let's start with the guy that turns out to be the player of the game, Peyton Sanford. So go back and you watch this game and re-watching it uh, here this evening before the podcast. You know, one thing really jumped out is, as you're watching it, boy, you're going to remember this as the Peyton Sanford game, but there wasn't a whole lot in the first half. You know, he got fouled, and, and it wasn't fouled on the shot, on the three-point shot. Saw three free throws go down. Hit a shot late in the first half. Hit a three-pointer there. But it's not like he was going nuts. It was what he did in the second half, where he had 14 second-half points. In the first half, there's a little bit of everything, from Aaron Euless hitting a corner three-pointer that rolled around and dropped in for him. Connor McCaffrey hitting a couple of shots inside. And, of course, the play of Philip Robracha. So Robracha's going up there against a pro. Now, Big Cliff Amori, he, he is a beast in there. And he got him in foul trouble, and he worked him, and he played hard, and he just, he's doing Philip Robracha things. I mean, this guy is now, before our very eyes, becoming an all-Big Ten caliber type of player. That's the kind of level that Philip, Philip Robracha is playing at right now. Robracha plays all 40 minutes in the game. 16 points, 12 rebounds, three block shots, had a couple of assists. And his ability, you know, one thing we talked about earlier this season is it felt like maybe at times I was a little bit too reliant to throw it in the post and seeing what happens. And, and Robracha struggled with, with that aspect a little bit. We saw, obviously, he was playing better, but the decision-making, and as more and more teams have double-teamed, ran into a little bit of issues out of him offensively, at least when those double teams came. That has not been the case here lately. He's getting the ball out quick. He's recognizing where that double team is coming from. And then not just getting rid of it, but making the correct pass out of it. Huge, huge stride forwards out of Philip Robracha. Not just the 16 and 12 that he had, but just understanding the game and, and the steps forward that we continue to see out of him. That was absolutely huge. Chris Murray wasn't loud, but when they needed a bucket, they went to him a couple of times. In the first half, as Rutgers is digging their way back into the game, he hit a shot. In the second half, it's down to 55-50. Wheels are starting to come off a little bit. Long scoring drought, he hits a three-pointer there. It just, when they needed that big moment, that big bucket, he was the guy there for them seemingly every single time. He was excellent. And, and Connor McCaffrey, so he finishes with six points, hit a couple of three-pointers. He's two of six from downtown, but 
You know, the plus minus number, something we talked about last game against Indiana, where Peyton Sanford far and away had the best plus minus. You know, it wasn't great when you look at the numbers for Connor and, and what he had in comparison. It was just every time he was on the floor, it felt like the team was a little bit more settled, more engaged, knew exactly what they were going to do. A couple other things. So we saw last game, both Tony Perkins and Aaron Euless, both those guys, for all intents and purposes, get benched during the second half of the game. There were moments where Fran just wasn't comfortable in the win against Indiana going with them. And in this one, though, neither one of them were great. I mean, there are aspects of the game that you're certainly scratching your head about. Euless hit two corner threes. That's great. Had five rebounds, three assists, all well and good. But he also turned it over four times. Perkins had two turnovers, and it felt like it was six. Both those guys, you're starting back, were combined for six turnovers. That's a little bit of a trouble. But they were doing other things. And that's what I loved out of Tony Perkins in a game where he goes two of 10, really struggled with the shot. Couldn't talk him down, had a three pointer earlier in the game, uh, hit another bucket in the lane. The shot still is not falling right now for Tony Perkins as he's trying to work his way out of a funk. We'll get to a guy that got out of funk here in just a moment. But yet, even with that happening, there were times that he was impacting the game in other ways, both defensively getting on the boards, helping out on the glass, rebounding some offensive rebounds. I think he had, what, three re offensive rebounds in the second half of the game, just doing other things. When the shot isn't falling, you do those things. And that's what I loved about Peyton Sanford. I mean, even going back, yeah, when he hit the shot against Indiana early on, and I, I told you as I was there in Carver, you could just feel the crowd just trying to will him to get the through the shooting slump and get it because we know. If I was going to be an NCAA tournament team, if they're going to battle back and get back in contention and make it for the eighth year of the last 10 for Fran McCaffrey, something Dr. Tom never did before, something Lou Dolson never did before, eight out of 10 years in NCAA tournament team. If they're able to do that, this will be one of the best coaching jobs, certainly, that he's done to get to that point. But this is the things that he is going to do for you. If they're going to get there, Tony Perkins is going to have to break out. You know that you're going to have to have Peyton Sanford not play at this level. Look, for, for him to go out like he did, the 14 second half points, just hitting those three pointers, dagger after dagger. When the game got tight, he was right there making big shots for him. They're going to need a complete team effort. This team is incredibly limited right now. And just look at the minutes that they play. So here's your starters. Robracha plays all 40. Chris Murray plays 34. 28 out of Perkins. 36 out of Aaron Euless. 31 from Connor. 22 out of Sanford, and then from that, he got four minutes from DeSante Bowen. He looked a little bit tentative out there as a freshman against that pressure that Rutgers is going to give to him. Got to the lane one time, made a nice bucket as he drove in there through the double team and got the play. He got three minutes out of Carter Kingsbury and two minutes out of Josh Dix. This is, for all intents and purposes right now, with no Patrick McCaffrey, this is a six-man team. Yet those six guys all did something different to help in the effort. This was also a team that goes out there in Rutgers that they played one of the best defensive teams in the country. They came in number two in the country at Ken Pomeroy, KenPom.com in defensive efficiency. Iowa, what do they do? Right away, they get on them. They're hitting shots. Hey, look, any offense is going to get look good when you're hitting shots, but they move the ball. Even when the scoring lows came, they went out there and they finished averaging 1.15 points per possession. That's good in general. But against a team as good defensively as Rutgers, I mean, we're talking elite level offensively. No surprise for Ann McCaffrey's teams, they can always score, and it's happening again. So here they are starting to get us to buy back in. All right, I'm doing it. I'm looking forward to the schedule. We know what's still in front of them. We're going to dig into that a little bit. We're going to bring hope back to the podcast here today after I told you this team was dead. Yeah, they make me look like a moron, and I love that. What more Iowa needs to do? We got football talk coming your way as well. Iowa picks up a big commitment in the recruiting realm from the transfer portal over the weekend. A big offensive lineman, a couple other names out there, and a couple of intriguing walk-ons. We'll get into that also as we roll through here. This is the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast.
Today's episode of the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast is brought to you by LinkedIn. Well, New Year is upon us, and I know a lot of people out there, you're thinking about hiring. Hey, you're a small business owner. That's what I am. Maybe you're a hiring manager. You know that success in 2023, it depends on the team members that you surround yourself with. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. With LinkedIn Jobs, you can hire qualified candidates more efficiently by matching open enrolls with people who have the skills, values, and experiences to help you achieve your goals. As a small business owner myself, the thing that I love about LinkedIn Jobs, of course, is, yes, great way to go through all those candidates, all those resumes, and do it quickly. Look, time is money. When you're a small business owner, it is about you and and how you get things done. LinkedIn Jobs absolutely has helped me with that. They attract qualified candidates to your open jobs with targeting tools, and it goes beyond just resume data using insights from your job post company and their 875 member profiles to put your post in front of the most qualified candidates. Identify those qualified candidates on LinkedIn Jobs and connect with them fast and for free. LinkedIn Jobs makes it easy to screen and rate applicants based on your job qualifications all on one platform. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires First leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash Lockdown College. Again, LinkedIn.com slash Lockdown College to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Trent Connick continuing with you here on the Lockdown Hawkeyes podcast. Thanks for making Lockdown Hawkeyes your first listen each and every day. So we roll through here. The excitement of the win. It was great, right? Beating Rutgers, going on the road. Look, I, I didn't think they were winning this game. In fact, I bet on Rutgers to win and cover. I, I thought there was going to be a little bit of a letdown against Indiana. Iowa comes out right away. So we dared to dream a little bit. And as the stretch began, starting last week against Indiana, we said at minimum, during this next five-game segment, Iowa had to be 4-1. and one. To dig out of the hole at 0-3 in the Big Ten, the loss to Eastern Illinois, all these things in order to get back into a realistic conversation for this team to even be considered a bubble team. What was going to happen? You had to go four and one. Well, they're two and one. Two and oh right now in in the start of things. So that feels great, right? You're you're feeling good about that. How about these couple of numbers? Mentioned Ken Pomeroy, analytic based site. It is a predictive measure, though it is not one of the NCAA uh, selection committees, one of their big things. It is part of the resume that is put together. They're up to 40th after the win against Rutgers. So a big, big step forward there. Uh, Another one, the NCAA net. And we know that is the sorting tool that the NCAA selection committee uses. Of course, it was the RPI for years now. Last, what, four or five years now, it has been this new net system that also uses efficiency uh, in its metrics to rate these teams. Iowa jumps up. 18 spots after the win against Rutgers. They were number 60. Even after the win against Indiana on the weekend, they jump all the way to number 42 uh, going into play on Monday. That is a huge, huge step forward and certainly good news for this team and putting together their resume. A couple of wins now in quadrant one. That is absolutely huge. You got to keep stacking up those quadrant one and quadrant two victories. They're always going to have the anchor. At the bottom, there's going to be that loss to Eastern Illinois. But again, we can also, if we get to the point where this team really is on the bubble, I mean, it's coming down to, you know, them and another team. What is going to be talked about it and really looked at, oh, how did they lose to Eastern Illinois? They're terrible. They did. But they did that without Chris Murray playing in that game and also without Connor McCaffrey. For all intents and purposes, playing without two starters in that game, that is a part of it. Still got to do work. Still got to get better. So let's take a look at the schedule and what Iowa has. Again, the five-game stretch, we're two games into it. Now you're home for the next three games. Coming up on Thursday, that's against Michigan. Michigan's been incredibly inconsistent this year. It has been an up-and-down season for them. We know Dickinson, he is an absolute load to handle. I think Jet Howard, Jawan Howard, the coach, his son is going to be pretty good. But but he has really, really been up and down throughout the course of the season. They lose over the weekend to Michigan State after it looked like maybe the Wolverines were starting to figure it out. So you got that one on Thursday. Then on Sunday, home for Maryland. Maryland inconsistent themselves. They had a nice win against Ohio State. You're you're never sure what Maryland team you're going to get as they're going through a transition of their own. You're number one of Kevin Willard coming in and taking over the reins there. And then it's Northwestern. And you look at these three games. According to Ken Pomeroy, they're favored by four against Michigan three against Maryland, and five against Northwestern. Yet, 
there's something about this Northwestern team. They're funky. Chris Collins, look, he's been there for a while. He got to the NCAA tournament. They won their first game ever as they were there in the NCAA tournament as they broke that spell, what, five, six years ago now. They are playing an elite level defensively right now. They got some guys you remember, Boo Booey. Yeah, he's still around there. Ty Perry, he's still uh, hitting around in his junior campaign. A lot of new names also part of it, but there's something about them. They went and got the win against Indiana uh, here on Sunday. Just uh, one to keep an eye on. But there's no layups here. There, there's no easy ones. You're going to have to grind it out. And, and this team, with their limitations, with the six-man rotation, it's not like all of a sudden you could handle you know, a couple of bad days from a couple of your, your guys. You're going to have to need that effort from Rebracha every single time. And against some of the big guys he's going to see here over the next week and a half, you're going to have to have performances game in and game out from Chris Murray. He's going to have to be the star. And if Sanford doesn't have it, you need Connor hitting shots. Or you need Josh Dix, who we talked about, and hitting that shot against Indiana, the defense he played. You're going to have to have other guys step up and make some plays. But it went from highly improbable to possible. That's where we are. That's where the expectations are. And uh, certainly an exciting time for Hawkeye fans. And I'm right there with you. And we'll be along for the ride. Thanks again for making Lockdown Hawkeyes your first listen every day. Make sure to check out our brand new podcast, Lockdown College Basketball. It's everything you need to know about college basketball in one place. Plus, hear from the big name experts, insiders, coaches, and players. Locked on College Basketball. It's available on YouTube and wherever you get podcasts. So let's shift over from the basketball front over to uh, a little football. Over the weekend, Iowa picks up a commitment on the offensive line, something that we've been talking about a lot here on Lockdown Hawkeyes. Iowa needs help there. The offensive line the last two years has been bad, and, and you can blame the offensive struggles up front, and I know there's a lot of blame that certainly needs to be laid there. So they go to the portal again, and Kirk Ferentz. Portal Kirk! How about that? A guy that Myself included, weren't sure with this changing landscape, how, landscape in college sports, how much he was going to be willing to adapt and change with it. Well, he is doing it on the fly, and he is reinventing himself in this program, and you have to credit him for doing that. So he goes out there and brings in John Parker, a young man who played D2 football, good player there, good size, you know, had some big time offers, including Virginia, where he was originally committed. And Iowa comes along. They stayed involved with him. Virginia, with the coaching changes that they're going through, including looking for a new offensive line coach, as their offensive line coach went to NC State. So then hired one. So he decided to keep looking around, even though he had signed a financial aid agreement. Lo and behold, he becomes a Hawkeye. He's going to be starting classes here, what, within the next week or so. He'll be on campus and ready to go. They need it, they need tackles. Now, we saw this year, even as Mason Richmond showed strides, I think big improvement at times during a sophomore campaign, you need more than that. Like they, they haven't had the answer out there. The Cody Ince injury really was devastating to this offensive line. We saw them try a couple of different guys. We, we saw Connor Colby out there early in the season. It was a frustrating year for him. Played much better when he moved inside. We saw Jack Plum. Saw a few other pieces out there. Ultimately, they need help at tackle. Question also is what happens with Walter Rouse, another offense alignment that was on campus this past weekend. I believe he uh, got there late on Thursday night, departed on Friday. Just a quick visit for him. He has visited Oklahoma, Iowa, and now Nebraska. Many people believe those are the three finalists for him. Again, a lot going into it. This guy, high academic kid, obviously went to Stanford to start out. Got to be pretty highly academic just to get in there. He was an all Pac-12 player. He was a guy that also took a little bit of step back this year, but Boy, you got to feel with what Iowa does with offensive linemen in the past. They're going to be able to clean up some things. Certainly the skill set is there. A guy that played incredibly well his first couple of years at Stanford was an all Pac-12 player, and you got to feel good about that. But hey, the services are going to be tough to come by. Uh, come by. A couple intriguing names also from the wide receiver uh, realm. First of all, uh, you look at Isaac Tesla. Okay. We're waiting. He was at Colorado this past weekend. I believe he's visited Arkansas. Of course, took the visits to Iowa and Iowa State. He's been all over the place, and he has blown up one of the biggest transfer wide receivers out there, the young man from Hillsdale. Well, his high school teammate, who was playing over at Dort, Hayden Large. How about that for a name? Hayden, of course, that's great. Large. He's a tight end, right? And I think I saw he had something like 16 receptions, something like, oh, okay. You know, what's this? Is this another filler piece? Is this a guy that's actually going to be able to compete? Uh, then I saw that Dor only completed like 
or maybe even through 90 passes, something like that this year. So not exactly a real pass heavy offense. So the numbers that he put up in it eh, look pretty good in comparison to what you think. We'll see. I mean, you're, you're taking a shot here again. This is a walk on candidate. You, you don't have big expectations for the guys, but if he can help out, you already have Eric all there along with Luke Lachey. I mean, as good of a one, two punch as you're going to find a little bit of depth to go along with it. Okay, not a bad thing there in a walk-on with Hayden Large. Another walk-on that'll be joining the program that turned down offers at the FBS level, Coastal Carolina, a couple of others, is Jackson Filer. Now, for you older guys like me, you'll remember, of course, his dad, Rodney, one of the nicest guys in the world, Rodney Filer. I met him a couple of different times and just absolutely love uh, talking with him and reminiscing about some of the football stories back in the day when he was with the Hawkeyes playing for Hayden back in the 90s. But his son, Jackson, a little bit undersized defense alignment. So he played a Dowling, I call a bunch of his games in high school. I mean, he was a difference maker all over the place. But probably 235 playing a defensive end. Look, he's going to be a specialist. If he's going to get on the field and cracking the rotation on this Iowa team is incredibly difficult to do. We know how deep that they are. Obviously, the return of Joe Evans coming back this year, that's going to add to it. Noah Shannon also coming back inside. It's going to be tough to find any kind of snaps out there for anybody coming in initially and coupled with, you know, the guys that we haven't even talked a whole lot about. We'll get into that. You know, spring football gets here. We'll be talking about some of those you know, freshmen, redshirt freshmen, guys that we haven't seen a whole lot. But there's a slew of guys also on that defensive line to get excited about. But Jackson Filer, just another name. Add to the list. Great off the ball. Really good technique. He's got that speed rusher mentality. And if he's a guy that can go out there, even if it is that limited role, you know, 12, 15 snaps a game, whatever it is, with his kind of ability and his ability to get to the quarterback, this guy was a junior college football Defensive player of the year, uh, one of the leaders in the sa in sacks in the country, can get after the quarterback all over the place. You will not turn down guys like that, and certainly guys like that that are going to be walking on. So really, really cool uh, story there. That's what we have on the football front. Put a wrap on things on the other side. A big weekend for Iowa basketball. A big recruiting weekend for Iowa football. How about the women's basketball team? How about the wrestling team? We'll talk about that as we come back here on Locked on Hawkeyes. Today's episode of the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one resource for sports betting information, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there. Pro football playoffs are now here. As a Bears fan, yeah, I got the Bears sweatshirt on, and we did it. We got the number one pick. Well, we're not going to be betting on the Bears, but we can bet on the playoffs. Bowl season, well, it comes to a close tonight with the national championship game, basketball, soccer, tennis. They got it all at Bet Online. If you love sports podcasts and you're hanging out with me, I'm going to guess that you do. You can find those also at Bet Online. Always the fastest and easiest way for your sports betting information. Hop on the website today or just jump on your phone to learn more. Bet Online, where the game starts. Trent kind of wrapping things up on the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Again, thanks for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen each and every day. As we put a cap on things here, we've talked football. We've talked men's basketball. Let's give a shout out to the ladies and what we saw out of them over the weekend. First of all, what a cool experience it is. And the Caitlin Clark effect, in effect, once again, as it becomes the first ever televised game for Big Fox, National Fox ever for women's basketball. That doesn't happen for Iowa without Caitlin Clark. So you have that component to it. Going on the road, a Michigan team that uh, probably had a little, I want to get back at Caitlin, you know, some of the highlights that you see, a couple of those were against Michigan. You know, that was going to be a part of it. And what happened? Iowa puts 94 on the board. And a 94-point effort where Caitlin Clark only has 28. I, I know you say only 28, but so efficient, 9 of 20 from three-point line, nearly 60% from the floor, just did a great job sharing the basketball. Caitlin just had three assists, but it was the other players stepping up. How about Monica Zazano with eight assists in the game? The setter putting up that performance, 19-5 and 8 out of Zazano, and a lot was going through her as they were trying to cover up uh, Caitlin Clark. Davis off the bench, I thought she was really good in, in one of her better games. Sulky. She was, Stokey was maybe 
one of her top performances of the year. I, I know she had a double double against Purdue, but she's really starting to come on and doing it in limited minutes. You know, she gets four or five minutes a half, something like that. An important piece. The depth is building for this Iowa women's basketball team. The Big Ten this year, hey, it's going to be tough. It, it absolutely is again this season. You know, the Big Ten's going to be up there. You got Ohio State still undefeated on the year at 16 0. You saw that Illinois team, the one that handed Iowa the loss last weekend. Just how good and basically a completely different team that they're playing. Brenda Free is always going to have Maryland playing at a high level. Indiana, Michigan. It's a good Big Ten this year, but Iowa. The women's team is going to be right there uh, once again. And then wrestling, uh, great getting a chance to see the wrestling meet right after things wrapped up on Big Ten Network with the basketball game. Spencer Lee gives up a takedown right away. Oh, boy, that, that's I don't see that very. Oh, no, he gets taken out. He's on his back. He's down 8-1. Well, he ends up pinning the kid from Purdue. <laughs> uh, Ramos still in the first period. I mean, just the dudes are incredible. And then how about afterwards? They're going back, so they're. Wrestling, and for all intents and purposes, a high school gym. And he goes back in the little holding area. They got a couple of curtains up there with you know, some wire pulls holding up the uh, the curtain there. He just headbutts it. It's just wrestlers, a, di a different breed. Hey, I grew up in Osage. I, I know all about you wrestlers. I tried. I wasn't good enough, but I will tell you, just different cats. And my best friends are wrestlers, and, and they are a different breed, no doubt about it. Iowa gets the win, though, wins it by 31. Obviously, it's all about building, getting things ready. Didn't see uh, Rail Woods over the weekend. Hope to have him back on the mat here pretty soon. Get that full complement. Get that lineup exactly where Brands wants it going in to March. Look, the gap between Penn State and everybody else this year, it is significant. After what we saw a year ago from the Nittany Lions, again, they're at the top of the heap. Got to feel great about where Spencer Lee is and where he's ultimately going to be by the time we get to March. They can have a full lineup. Going to have to get some breaks. I mean, that's the name of the game. There is a gap between a Michigan, excuse me, Penn State and everybody else, but but certainly for Iowa. Good one. Nice victory. Beat uh, Illinois on Friday night. Tight. Couple of matches that that swing matches went the other way. Brands wasn't real happy with a couple of the performances and the low scoring affairs. Want to see a little more aggressiveness, especially out of some of those upper weight guys uh, going forward. But hey, that's what coaching's all about. We'll have those guys ready to go by the time we get to March. Well, that does it for today here on the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Thanks as always for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen. Again, for your second listen, check out our brand new podcast. It is Locked On College Basketball. Our experts, Isaac Shadi and Andy Patton, they're going to bring you everything you need to know on and off the court. You can hear from big name experts, coaches, players all throughout the college basketball landscape. It's very simple. Locked on College Basketball. It's available on YouTube, just like we are here and wherever you get podcasts. Iowa men get back at it on Thursday as they'll welcome Michigan to town. We got more football talk coming your way. We got you covered with wrestling, women's basketball. It is a busy time. It is a great time to be a Hawkeye after a down couple of weeks, a couple of weeks ago. We're back riding high again. That's a good place to be. We'll talk to you again tomorrow here on Locked on Hawkeyes. Go Hawks.